All right, well, I'm going to admit something to you here today. I love to buy new clothes. That's right. I just love to get new clothes. I don't know if you call me a clothes horse or a fashion aficionado or not, but I enjoy getting new clothes. Clothes that fit right. Well, they're, they're clean. They got those crisp lines. And you, you just feel good, right? Let's get some new clothes. Maybe you don't personally appreciate my own sense of style, and that's okay. We could still be friends, I think. But I just am one of those guys who gets excited for a trip to the outlet mall. I get excited if uh, the Stitch Fix for Men box is going to show up at my doorstep, and I get to open it up, see what's inside. Get pumped. Pick out new bright colors sophisticated patterns, those favorite outfits that you can find that become your go-tos, that that become the ones that you wear when you want to dress to impress, right? Whether that's a new client or your boss or your spouse. But the problem is, the more that you wear something, the more worn it becomes. And maybe you notice this with some of your clothes, right? The fabric starts to get frayed or pilly. Uh, the colors of that fabric, they, they fade over time. The seams start to, to rip apart and the hems come out. And maybe if it truly is like your favorite outfit, maybe you don't notice, maybe, maybe you don't actually care because it's your favorite. Maybe you think you can repair it, you can fix it, you you can patch over the holes, you you could sew back those seams together, you can iron out the the wrinkles and, and get out the stains, but eventually you come to a point where you realize, and you have to realize, you have to understand that even though it's your favorite, even though it's your go to outfit, It's destined, it needs to be retired to the garbage bin. And you need to find a new favorite. You know, there's even uh, psychology behind clothing. And how it makes us feel when we wear different clothes. I found this term on the internet, so take that as you weigh. Maybe it's not really true, but enclosed cognition describes how the different clothes that we wear affect our moods and our behaviors and our attitudes and the way that we interact with other people and the confidence that we have. So if we dress in clothing that is associated with intelligence, then we feel smarter. If we choose to to power dress, then we feel more powerful, more confident. We evaluate other people based on the clothing that they're wearing in any given situation. And we self-consciously evaluate ourselves. And so the experience of wearing something can subtly change our attitudes and our choice of behavior. Now, of course, you didn't come here today for a fashion lesson. But I'm sharing these things with you because I want to help you to understand the language that the Apostle Paul uses as he writes to the Ephesians and as he encourages us. Because the the language of clothing is the picture of that Paul uses to describe the life that we have, the life that we can live because we have the greater hope that comes in Christ Jesus, our Savior. And so Paul asks, if you are wearing old, worn out, torn, and dirty clothing, Paul asks you if you have clothed yourselves mentally and emotionally with the things that you think and you believe are going to allow you to achieve success and accomplishment and have hope and live with purpose in your life, only to then find out that they leave you disappointed and empty. The Bible delivers tremendous truth 
tremendous promises of incredible hope and purpose that we have in Christ Jesus, our Savior. This greater hope. And every single day, you have the choice to clothe yourself with that hope that you know in Christ. To clothe yourself with those promises that Jesus has given you. Or to return to something far, far less. And so as we look at this language that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4, he speaks with some very clear, hard-hitting words. And he bases all of the conclusions that he makes here on what he has previously said. He had encouraged believers to live a life worthy of the calling that they had received, the calling that you have received. The calling to understand that you are a part of God's own family through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, live the part. He had just got done to encourage those believers to remind them that every single member of God's family has been equipped, has been blessed and gifted with abilities so that they can serve one another, so that they can help one another to grow in maturity and faith in Christ Jesus. And if we are growing together into this maturity in Christ, then there will be evidence of that growth in our lives. And so Paul insists, he insists that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Here when Paul uses that term, Gentiles, he's not talking about ethnicity, he's talking about spirituality. This is all about faith. When he says Gentiles here, he's talking about those who do not see Jesus as their Savior from all sin. They do not trust in him for that very reason. They don't recognize that Jesus is the only one who would allow them to stand before their God redeemed forgiven, chosen, dearly loved people. They do not have this greater hope to which you and I cling. And so they cling to a different hope. Their mindset is different. They cling to different things. And as they place their hope and their confidence in those other things, they clothe their life with them, and it makes that mindset futile. Because any mindset, any hope, any joy that we want to find and experience, any love that we have, any desire apart from Christ is empty. It is hollow and pointless. There is no real hope that is found apart from Christ. And so Paul continues then to describe this mindset, this life. He says they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. You see, God alone is the one who grants to us a life that is filled with real meaning real purpose, real love, real wisdom, real understanding, real hope, real joy. Only God can give those things because God is the very one who has created those gifts, who has blessed us with those things. And so Paul says they're separated. They're separated them either because of ignorance, they they don't know, I mean, no one has shared with them the incredible good news of Jesus and all that he has done for us. Or maybe they do know they, that message has been shared with them. Others have spoken it to them, but they refuse to believe it. They refuse to trust in it. They have hardened their hearts to it. And that leads to dark and dangerous places. Paul continues, having lost all sensitivity They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, 
They are full of greed. Human beings can lose their sense of shame. Their hearts can become calloused. I'm often uh, very jealous of our musicians who lead us in worship. Uh, I'm jealous of the ability and the talents that they have because I would love to be proficient in really any instrument. But I am especially jealous of our guitarist. Um, Actually, I had a guitar once because back in high school and college, the cool people could play guitars. And so I asked for a guitar for Christmas, and I got one. And I played it a little bit. I practiced a little bit. And do you know what I remember? My fingers hurt. You know, and you try to hold down those, those metal strings against the fretboard to, to strike the right chord. And after you practice for a little bit, those fingers, they're, they're sensitive, they, they're painful, they hurt. Until you've practiced and played guitar long enough that the skin on your fingers hardens and you get calluses there. And then they're not so sensitive. It doesn't pain those fingers as you hold down the strings. And that's great and that's amazing when it comes to making music. It is not good and not great not amazing when it comes to our hearts and our hearts losing their sensitivity to immorality. When our hearts become calloused and hardened because we've exposed them to immorality over and over and over again, it leads to sensuality, It leads to indulging in every kind of impurity. It becomes this insatiable appetite that we have for these ungodly desires. And the more that you live your life like that, the harder and harder that your heart can become. You you push your heart against it and, and the callus starts to form. And dear friends, our hearts can become calloused and hardened, too. We can put our hope and our trust in other things as well. We can fall into this mindset. You think about living a life separated from your God. Uh, Does your success in your job and your career, does that become the overarching principle that guides and governs everything in your life? Because you've forgotten the grand narrative of the kingdom of God? Are you so caught up in the people that you want to impress in this world? They're impressed with your accomplishments and your successes that you forget that in Jesus, you get to stand before God Almighty, the holy and righteous judge of all, and he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in my happiness. You know, just start to compare the the house that you have or can afford, the the car that you drive, the boat that you wish you had. You start to compare that with your friends or your your co-workers and and what they have. And it seems that you have forgotten that God promises you that he is building for you a mansion, a luxurious and extravagant mansion in heaven above, and he has promised you that he will hand you the keys. You're so concerned with planning grand vacations for your family, for yourself, because you just, you got to get away. You got to get away from all the stress, and and you're so tired, and you're weary from the job, and and everything else. But you forgot that 
your Savior Jesus, who loves you so much, he is the one who says to you, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and find rest for your soul. And you feel the, the pull of power that you can have in this world, in this life, when, when you can be in charge of others, and you can gain, and, and you know you can acquire that power in different ways in this life, but it leads you to, to turn your back on your Savior and His call to you to humbly love and serve because the first will be last and the last will be first. You know, sometimes we too, we put our hope in other things. But all of that... Apart from Christ, all of that is empty. It's vain, it's futile. But dear friends, you know your God. You have learned the far greater hope that is in Christ. And so Paul says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus you know the truth in Jesus. You know the truth of all his incredible promises to you. And the good news of Jesus teaches you to live differently. In Jesus, you find the life that is truly life because you know all your sins were laid on Jesus. You know that he spilled forth his blood on the cross of Calvary for you. You know that he was willing to have his hands and his feet pierced to hold him to that tree so that you could be set free to live in joy, to live in forgiveness. You know that God laid on him the punishment that we all deserve. And this gospel truth, it changes your life. And the change that it brings to your life is something that you learn. The truth of Jesus, it teaches you. You grow in it. It presents you a new way to clothe your life. Paul says you were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self. To understand that that it's time to retire that clothing and, and throw it in the garbage bin. And instead to be made new in the attitude of your minds. To put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Anyone here ever guilty of grabbing the clothes that you wore yesterday? You know, you you missed the laundry basket a little bit, and it was okay because you were in a hurry that morning, so you just grabbed them up off the floor, and you threw them on. I think I did that yesterday, actually. But they're wrinkled. They're dirty. They smell. You don't want to wear those. Not when you have something amazing and beautiful hanging in your closet right there. The amazing and beautiful life that Jesus gives to you. What Jesus does in your heart with his truth, he doesn't just iron out the wrinkles. He doesn't just like re-dye the fabric to, to make it a little bit brighter or wash it clean. He doesn't just patch over the holes or re-sew the, the hems that have torn apart. No, oh, Jesus, he gives you something new. He gives you something entirely new, beautiful, clean, and fresh to wear in your life. It has been created to be like God in righteousness and holiness, and it will make an impact, so wear it. Put it on. Wear the truth of Jesus' grace. Wear the blessings that he gives to you every single day. Wear this good news of forgiveness. Wear it because Jesus has purchased and bought it for you. He has purchased and bought it with his holy, precious blood. Put on the new self. 
And Paul shows us exactly what this kind of life is going to look like in the next few verses. He says we're to put away lying and deceiving and instead to speak truthfully to one another. He says instead of allowing your anger to fester and and boil over and explode in rage to address that anger. Instead of giving Satan an opportunity where he can easily tempt you into greater sin, he says address it at the source. Talk to the person. Overcome that anger with good. Seek a resolution. Seek to understand where that person is coming from and do it immediately. Don't wait. Don't allow it to sit and stew, but get rid of it. He said, instead of stealing, instead of trying to take what isn't rightfully yours, instead of trying to to fudge on your tax documents, he says, be honest, work hard. Work hard, and not only so that you can be blessed by God, so that you can have enough for yourself, but so that God can use you to be a blessing for others, to be generous. He says, use your words to express grace and compassion instead of tearing people down. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not turn your back on your faith. To remember that you have been sealed, you have been marked with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. And so bitterness, get rid of it. Rage, throw it away, drop it. Slander, avoid it. Wrath, squelch it. Malice, throw it away. Instead, practice kindness and compassion. Practice forgiveness because Christ Jesus himself forgave you. And it all comes back to Christ and his forgiveness. It all comes back to the greater hope that you have and the change that that greater hope can make in your life. You may not get as excited as me about shopping for new clothes. Maybe you hate shopping for new clothes. Maybe you have the same wardrobe from 1999 and you're okay with that. But I hope and I pray that you are beyond excited for the new that Christ has given to you. I hope and pray that you are beyond excited that every single day because of the forgiveness that is yours in Christ Jesus, you get to wake up And you get to put on new clothes, a new life. Take off the old and put on the new. Amen? Amen.